they're taking shortcuts, they're treating it as a superficial, something in the way, something to be bypassed. Okay? A lack of mechanical integrity, okay? poor maintenance and training. Those are the three threads that come through this, these big incidents that have happened. Okay? So this management of functional safety, which is the, the key, the anchor for the functional safety standards, um, was introduced to avoid and prevent systematic faults from occurring. I will look at what, why are we addressing that okay, in the next slide. We want to maintain process safety. Okay, we want to be tracking incidents. We want to be tracking those leading indicators. We want to be acting on lagging indicators. We want to be making sure that we can reduce the accident rate on our facilities to a level that is acceptable to the regulator and to the public at large. Okay. And then, ensuring the integrity of your SIS, your safety instrument assistant system, is make sure that your SIS is properly met, uh, engineered and implemented and maintained, you need good management of functional safety. Okay, so the management of this whole thing is key. And the reason for this is, the HSE did a study in uh, 1995, and I just updated it, this is a drawn from the 1995 study. And they looked at 52 incidents, and they went and said, what is the root cause? And they created this, this pie graph. And you can see that specification Identify best practice. 
The secret in the is regard, recognize as being radical. Another acronym, it's uh, recognized as generally accepted good, good engineering practice. Okay. Now there's been certain cases, court cases, certainly in Australia and in New Zealand, where the judges who have handed down the sentences have said, from a legal point of view, 61511 and 61508 are regarded as good engineering practice, and they do not see why engineers do not follow it. If they're not going to follow it with the judgment, then they need to demonstrate what standard they use and why it's better than 61508 or 61508. Okay. So the legal fraternity is now regarding this as something that must be used when designing an engineering safety system. And certainly the insurance industry is very obvious. This. We are training engineers now, or engineers, technicians, or whatever you want to call them, that work with insurance companies, help them understand the standard, help them how it should be applied as part. Over 500 have signed up worldwide. This is being rolled out by AIG at the moment. So this is happening. We've talked with Lloyd, we've talked with Marsh as well. So they are learning about the standard. They want to understand what this means, how they can look at a plant and see whether you've applied it or not. Okay. It is a performance-based standard. It is not prescriptive. Performance-based. Okay. We're trying to ensure the problems of the past are not repeated. We're trying to provide a consistent approach to identifying and mitigating or managing risk. So that if I do it, you do it, or someone else does it, you get consistent results. It's a structured way of doing work. Okay. We want to provide an optimal design that meets the risk that's being managed. We don't want to over-engineer, we don't want to under-engineer. We want to be right at the point, we want to be at the best point. We don't want to spend too much money, but certainly we don't want to spend too little money because then we're in a dangerous situation. So we, we need to manage this, we need to do proper analysis, okay? And we need to consistently measure performance. This reminds you of the ISO 9000 system. Monitor, measure, and improve. So if you can measure something, you can set yourself goals, you can improve. That's the ISO system. It's just the same thing. You set yourself safety goals, and you try and improve. I forgot to say at the beginning, if you've got any questions, please raise your hand. We can have a discussion about it. So, the current functional safety standards Governed by 615 over 8. That is the like the master standard for functional safety. It is written for every industry. But the terms of English that's used there is written for all and sundry. It's written for medical, nuclear, mining, automotive, functional safety, process safety, machine safety, whatever safety you can think of. It is written for that. Okay, there's a seven-part series. If you print it out, it's a Standard about that thing. Okay. Very, very comprehensive. So we as engineers, we know that we're not really want to sit there sifting through this massive standard. So what we've done is we've written some process or industry specific standards. There's 61513 for the nuclear, there's 62061 for the machinery safety, and there's 61511 for the process industry. Now the difference between 62061 and 61511 is machinery safety deals where, with situations where people are always near the hazard. Presses, lathes, um, cutting, or plasma cutting, that sort of thing, when you're manufacturing something. Um, an example there is when you're making the bonnet of a car. You take a piece of steel, you put it into the press, you step back and you press a button. Press two buttons and the press comes down and snaps out the shape. So the operators are always in close proximity to the hazard. If they happen to have their hands in there, it comes down. You're dealing with the severed limbs, pinching, crushing injury. Okay. Whereas the process industry, we're dealing with the big ones, the explosions, um, the toxic events, okay, which occur on refineries, occur on very big. Chemical plants. So 
is written for a chemical plant, for a processing plant. Okay. This is the basic 